Hello again. All right, this week, um, I wasn't supposed to be teaching the first years and then one of our teachers didn't turn up. Um, he was ill, fair enough. We have a lot of different teachers teaching on the Swansea University Medical School course, which is great fun because we get surgeons in and radiologists and pathologists and all sorts, really, really good fun. Anyway, he didn't turn up, um, so I had to step in at the last minute and um, when I looked at the learning outcomes, we were talking about essentially the, the big blood vessels in the neck, right? Now there's a lot going on in the neck. The neck's a very important region. We don't cover it all in one week, we cover it in multiple weeks. But I thought, how can I talk about um, the blood vessels of the neck for half an hour? I mean, you know your carotid arteries and your jugular veins, right? But then when I got into it, I realized actually there is quite a lot to talk about here. So I thought, let's do it again, because I've already done it once, right? And then add a few things to it and yeah. So that's the aim of this video is, I'm gonna talk about the major blood vessels of the neck. I had four cups of tea back to back, so I should be good for at least 20 minutes. So we should, I think, look at the arteries first and we'll follow them up from the thorax and then we can follow the veins back down again, right? Makes sense, go up, come back down, follow the flow of blood, right? So what can we see in the thorax? Well, you know that from the heart, we've got the, um, the, the aortic, they have got the ascending aorta, which is coming out of the left ventricle and that's gonna send blood all around the body. So it's a really, really big blood vessel, very muscular, and it curves posteriorly and towards the left side. But as it curves, so now we're in, this is the aortic arch. As it curves, it gives off these three arteries. The first artery, they're all hidden by the veins here. The first branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. Um, also gets called the innominate artery, and that's a taking blood vessels, that's taking arteries over to the right side because the aorta is going to the left, so it's taking them over to the right because we're not very symmetrical when we're adults, right? Well, we're not so very symmetrical after an early embryonic stage, but that's another story. Anyway, so the first branch, brachiocephalic trunk. The second branch is the left common carotid artery. And we can see that coming up here. And the third branch is the left subclavian artery. And that goes around here, we can see it here, so the left subclavian artery is going off to the left shoulder and the left upper limb. But today we're interested in this left common carotid artery as it's ascending here. Now on the right side, the brachiocephalic trunk is only short, it's going from here to here, and then it's dividing into two, and it's giving the right common carotid artery, which is going up here in the neck, and the right subclavian artery, which is going off to the right shoulder and the right upper limb. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of asymmetry. We're different on the left and the right. And that is important, important clinically. That has a whole bunch of interesting effects. Um, okay, but just talking about the anatomy, do you see something interesting about the common carotid artery as it ascends through the neck? It's interesting because look, it's not giving off any branches. So the, the, the common carotid artery just goes up through the neck. Now in the neck, there are an awful lot of important structures um, that we care about. The anterior neck is very vulnerable and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and one of the reasons you might be interested in the carotid arteries or system of carotid arteries is because you want to be able to find the carotid pulse, right? Can you find your carotid pulse? I think when, we, when we're asked to find our pulse in our necks, we all go to the same place. Got mine, it's up here. And look, we're, I know, this beard needs to trim, doesn't it? Gotta get, ooh, not a good week for doing <laughs> carotid pulse videos. Um, but we go right up here, so we're going up in the angle. So why do we do that? And what artery are we actually palpating there? So we can feel here, here's the thyroid cartilage, right? There's the laryngeal prominence. So we're kind of at that level, we're at the level of the upper end of this cartilage, kind of at the level of the hyoid bone. Uh, and we're going really, really deep, kind of into the angle there, and we can find the pulse of an artery, and that's the carotid pulse. Um, and if we squeeze medially, ah, it's not very nice, because we're, that's our, um, the, the cartilages of our airway are in there. Ooh, this is what I'm talking about here. Here's the thyroid cartilage. There's the laryngeal prominence. 
the hyoid bone is up in there. So this is where we were palpating, right? And if we look at this side with the mandible in place, that's where we were palpating up in there. Now, when you have the muscles in place, this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle here, we can't really see any of those blood vessels. There's a little triangle here, there's a space where the arteries become visible. And we have to cut away those muscles to see those arteries. So that's where we're palpating there. The common carotid artery ascends and it ends uh, at this point here where it splits into two and it splits into the external carotid artery which is anterior and the external carotid artery is going to branch to the face. It's going to give off branches that go to the face and the deep face and superficial face in places like that. Whereas the internal carotid artery is going to go posterior um, and it's, it's not going to give off many branches, it's going to go, well, sorry, is it going to give off any branches? Probably not. It's going straight up into the skull to supply blood to the brain. Go and read about the circle of Willis and you'll meet the internal carotid artery again where it appears inside the skull, supplying blood to the cerebral hemispheres. Um, if you look at the cranial foramen, you'll see the, the carotid canal, which is a lovely bit of anatomy because it does that shape. Anyway, so, and at this point here, this is actually a really important location here, where the common carotid artery splits into internal and external carotid arteries, we find two structures. We find the carotid sinus and the carotid body. And here, these structures, we find chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. This is a site in the body where the brain, essentially, is sampling the blood. And it's looking at the chemical composition of the blood and it's looking at blood pressure. And this is part of the homeostatic um, control of blood pressure and blood gases. So this area is really important. That information is carried back to the brain um, by a cranial nerve. I'm not going to tell you which one. Have you heard about massaging this area here, this, uh, the area where you find the carotid sinus and the carotid body? No? Go Google that. That's interesting. No, I better not. Bonus points to you if you either know or go and look up which cranial nerve is carrying that information back from this location here. Anyway, now what can we see here? Oh, well, we can see this one right here. So typically the first branch of the external carotid artery is this artery here. Can you see where it's going? What's this gland here? This is the thyroid gland. So this artery supplying blood to the thyroid gland is the superior thyroid artery. It's usually the first branch of the external carotid artery. Sometimes it's coming off right at the junction. It might come off the common carotid artery, but typically that's where we see it. And we see two other branches as well, close together under here. We see the lingual artery and the facial artery. And the lingual artery is going to the tongue, lingua. And the, the facial artery is going to curl around the mandible and come up here and supply blood to the face, kind of the superficial structures of the face. Mm -hmm. There we go, we see it there. There we go, that's what we're seeing there. There's the facial artery here. It's distinctive because we always find it wiggling around the, uh, the border of the mandible. There's a facial vein running with it. Look on this model, facial artery and vein are together under there. Um, so we have lingual artery, facial artery, and we also have a branch going off to the occipital region back here, which is the occipital artery. Um, but the really important branch, I would say, is the uh, maxillary artery, which we can't see on here. Look at this beautiful detailed model of the deep face. And the mandible has been cut away here. That's the external carotid artery running up there and this that's the maxillary artery all right so the maxillary artery is a branch of the external carotid artery and it's a, it's a blood vessel going into the deep face this being the maxillary region here so maxillary artery facial artery and the maxillary artery gives off another artery that we're often very interested in which is the um, middle meningeal artery and the middle meningeal artery goes inside the skull and lies on the opposite side of the bone here. And that's the blood vessel that's often torn 
when the bone is fractured here, which um, can cause death fairly quickly, if not sorted out. So middle meningeal artery. So that's the maxillary artery coming off the external carotid artery. There's also a posterior auricular artery. But the other one that we're quite interested in is you can, you know, you can feel the pulse up here in your temple. That's my pulse there. Can you find your pulse? That's the superficial temporal artery. Um, and also an interesting one for bits of pathology you may come across. Um, but the superficial temporal artery is also a branch of the external carotid artery. That's pretty much it, it ending, right? So that's what we're seeing up here, right? The superficial temporal artery. You see all these branches. And um, there's the, uh, there's the occipital artery. There's the occipital artery back here and posterior auricular artery there. So why is this called your temple? Um, why is this the temporal region? Um, well, <clears throat> I may have mentioned this before, but uh, temporal means time. And men, I've got a little bit of gray hair here, so uh, men tend to show the passing of time by developing gray hair in the temporal region. I don't know if ladies do. I assume they do, but um, I never see that much gray hair on ladies. But anyway, um, so this gets called the temporal region. That's a very old term. I think it's probably Greek because um, this region shows the passing of time with the greying of hair. But that means that this region, so you have the temporal bone here, you have the temporal lobes of the brain, um, and then you have the superficial temporal artery. And you can see how temporal has become temple. It's a layperson's term. So these get called your temples, which is really what we're talking about is the temporal region of your head. Cool, huh? Um, and that's about it for the external carotid artery. So the external carotid artery is going up and giving off a whole bunch of branches into the face and the scalp and, and so on. Whereas the internal carotid artery is disappearing off into the skull to supply blood to the brain. So by the way, structures of the body, there's a common carotid artery and an internal carotid artery and an external carotid artery on either side. There's no such thing as a carotid artery. If somebody answers carotid artery in one of my exams, they tend to get a zero because my students are better than that. Um, and it's the same with the, uh, the veins. We have jugular veins, but we have an internal jugular vein and an external jugular vein. Now what we can see on this model, this is the internal jugular vein. And veins tend to be a little bit superficial to arteries. Arteries and veins often run together, the big main ones. And we see this throughout the body. And we tend to see this theme that the veins are a little superficial to the arteries. And we're seeing this here in the neck. But this is the internal jugular vein. So where's the external jugular vein? Well, it's been removed. Um, we've got muscles and what have you on this side, but it's still not there. If we look at this model, we don't, we can see there's the internal jugular vein here, but the external jugular vein isn't present on that side. Um, ah, but we can see it. We can see it here on this model. The external jugular vein is very superficial. You're more likely to see it in a person than you are on a model. Um, if I talk really, really rapidly and move the muscles in my head and my face and keep moving, and keep putting the blood into my face and have to push the blood out through my face, then you should see the external jugular vein starting to appear on the skin of my neck. Is it present? I can't see because I'm not looking at the thing. Is it there? Oh yeah. Yeah, so that, see that there that's popping up as I keep moving my face, keep pulling blood into the muscles of my face, and then it goes out of the muscles of my face, and then blood in, blood out, blood in, blood out, blood in, blood out, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. That is the external jugular vein. So that's the external jugular vein. It's very, very superficial. It's just underneath the skin, and it's draining blood from the superficial parts of the face, you know, from the muscles and what have you. Um, the arteries of the, the, the veins of the, of the neck do tend to, or rather, the veins of the face and the neck do tend to mirror the pattern of the arteries that we just talked about. And you can see some of that around here. Um, so the more superficial veins of the face are going to drain to another vein, which it doesn't have an artery to match it, which is the retromandibular vein. And that's linking up some of these blood vessels like the facial vein with some of the superficial temporal veins and what have you. And that then forms the external jugular vein. And the external jugular vein, although it's, it's gone because we've taken the muscles and the skin away, 
that's it there. This is the internal jugular vein here. That's the external jugular vein. This is the subclavian vein. So the, the external jugular vein is draining into the subclavian vein here. Whereas the internal jugular vein is very, very deep. Um, and it's also receiving a number of blood vessels from the face. But its major task is in taking all the blood from the cranial cavity, from the brain, out of the cranial cavity and draining it back to the circuitry system. So whereas the, the internal carotid arteries on either side are supplying blood to the brain and so are the vertebral arteries, so you've essentially got four arteries supplying blood to the brain, all, pretty much, almost all of the blood from the brain and the cranial cavity is draining out through these two internal jugular veins. So they're pretty important. It's interesting actually, when you look inside the cadaver, you see these lovely, firm, round, tough um, internal, uh, well, internal common carotid arteries. But the internal jugular vein is, is much larger, but it's very thin walled and it flattens very easily. It's very, very thin. Um, and the internal jugular vein, look, on either side, if this is the subclavian vein on the left, and this is the left internal jugular vein, as they meet, they form the left brachiocephalic vein. And the left brachiocephalic vein meets the right brachiocephalic vein, so the same structure is formed on the right side. And when those two meet, they form the superior vena cava, and then that drains into the right atrium, and all that blood goes back to the heart. Um, you can see the inferior thyroid vein here. There are superior thyroid veins and middle thyroid veins and all sorts of things um, mirroring the arterial supply that we can't see on these models. Note how the right brachiocephalic vein is longer than the left because the superior vena cava is shunted to the right. It shifted over to the right side, right? So it has to be longer on the left to go. So the, we have the aorta on the left and the superior vena cava on the right. right? We're, we're not symmetrical anymore. Um, and the internal jugular vein is very interesting. Right? You know that we've got valves in our veins throughout our body, particularly, say, the veins of the lower limb. There's lots of valves there so that blood gets pushed up our lower limbs back into the pelvis and the abdomen. We see a few valves elsewhere in the body. But in the um, internal jugular vein, we see um, some valves at about this level, you know, a few centimetres above where the internal jugular vein um, meets the subclavian vein. And look, the path between the heart and that point is, it's really, really short. So something you might be able to see in people, particularly if they're sat up and in just the right position, is a little pulsation around here. Um, if we had the skin on here, you see this little pulsation here. Um, superficially, kind of in a gap between the muscles and the, and the bones and what have you. And you can, you can see the jugular venous pulse there. And what's happening is that as the heart is, is pulling blood in and what have you, the, the thin-walled internal jugular vein is pulsing here beneath the skin. And you can, a very experienced doctor can judge the pressure in the right atrium by looking at that pulse in the neck. It's very cool. Another interesting thing, actually, is that, because um, of course the blood's flowing this way, so the valve is preventing blood from going that way. So if you, if you do a headstand or if you're upside down, the blood doesn't go up through these veins and all drain back into your head. Yeah, you do get increased blood pressure in your head, but that's because you're standing on your head and you've got blood going in there from the arteries, you're not. Anyway, um, in surgery, if surgeons are dissecting around this region here, you can imagine it might be quite dangerous. You certainly don't want to nick the uh, internal carotid artery. Uh, you don't want to nick the common carotid artery, although that's fairly thick-walled. But of course, the internal jugular vein is very thin-walled. You really don't want to nick that. A huge amount of blood is passing through there. But the real risk, which I think is lessened today, is that um, if you were to cut a large hole in the internal jugular vein, the risk isn't so much of losing blood, it's of air being drawn in, right? Um, you could get an embolism. Air, look, if air goes into the internal jugular vein, it can get pulled into the heart. And if the heart is a pump, 
in a, in a fluid system that's pumping fluid around the body, if you get air in a pump, that pump doesn't work anymore because it's not pumping anything, it's just making foam. So that's really, really dangerous. Um, and this was a bigger problem, I think, or it is a bigger problem in surgery that's done when somebody's sitting up. Neurosurgery is often done that way. Um, and I think it used to be more of a problem before anaesthetics and that sort of thing. Nowadays, with the patient led on the bed, it's less of a problem. But surgeons tell me that what they do is they, if it happens, oh no, his brain's falling out. That's not good, because I'm not a surgeon, isn't it? Um, the, if you, the, the thing is, I mean, what you do is, if that happens, you tilt the patient's head down so the blood will refill the internal jugular vein to stop air going into the heart, refill it with blood, right? In reality, what's got to happen is you've got to have a, a hole kind of large enough and normally the internal jugular vein will probably collapse anyway if it's a big hole because it's so, so thin-walled which will stop air going in and of course you've got to have, not have blood running through it so if you just nicked it and there's blood flowing through it you're probably not going to pull much air into it and blood will come out right so it is a risk but it's not incredibly common but I think it's an in interesting piece of anatomy that how you can get an air embol embolism in here and um, uh, stop the heart And there's something else as well, right? The film industry. This is a pretty gory subject, but you know, you see in films somebody delicately slices someone's throat with a knife and the blood comes out and they die instantly. Have you looked at the anatomy of the neck? Um, sure, we see all these great big blood vessels here on this model, but look, with all the muscles in place, can you see any of those blood vessels? No, we had to go all the way up in here just to feel the pulse, right? And this is a big muscle. This is sternocleidomastoid here. So. The, the anatomy here in the neck is protecting those big blood vessels and protecting those structures. If you cut the skin here, yes, there's a risk of cutting the external jugular vein and other um, veins and blood vessels in the skin, but it's all right, it's not a terrible thing, um, it's not good. But in reality, to cut the carotid artery, well, the carotid artery is deep to the internal jugular veins. So if you're going to cut the carotid artery, you're going to cut the internal jugular vein for sure, uh, but you've got to cut all the way through this thick muscle here, this sternocleidomastoid muscle. So in reality, when this happens, it's a terribly grisly, deep, horrific injury. And people often, I mean, they do die very quickly if you slice through someone's carotid artery. Um, but usually we also see injuries to the thyroid cartilages, um, to all of these muscles, and often even to the cervical vertebrae, which are way under these muscles here. So you've got to, you've got to cut deep and horribly to, um, yeah, it's not nice, is it? But my point is, these structures we've been talking about are generally quite well protected, even though the neck itself is a vulnerable region. Right, let's pop his brain back in. Sorry, or her brain. Uh, the aim was to look at the major blood vessels of the neck and we've looked at the carotid system of arteries and we've looked at the jugular system of veins and we've followed the blood up and followed the blood down and we've talked about a number of, a number of branches. Okay, hopefully um, that was interesting. See you next week.